GVOL's lesson on the Black-Scholes model. Today we're going to analyze the mathematics behind the Black-Scholes model and develop an intuition for the formula. One of the key assumptions to remember about the Black-Scholes model is that we're dealing with returns and not prices. Furthermore, we're dealing with continuously compounded returns. Lastly, we're assuming that these continuously compounded returns are normally distributed. When we're talking about normal distributions, the standard normal distribution is especially important. The standard normal distribution has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. Some of you who have taken statistics classes before might remember something called the z-table. The z-table is in relation to the standard normal distribution, and it allows you to look up the probability of a given amount of standard deviations occurring. With this table, it saves you the time from calculating the integral of the normal distribution and calculating the area under the curve. Instead, you can take the standard deviation and just translate it into a probability. When developing intuition behind the math for the Black-Scholes formula, one of the core concepts to remember is good variance versus bad variance. How much in the money my option is versus how much out of the money it is. How in my favor it is versus how out of my favor it is. Here is the Black-Scholes formula in its whole. We look at the current stock price times the normal distribution probability of D1 minus the present value of the strike price times the normal distribution probability of D2. This formula is for a call option. Let's dig deeper into the formula. Something to keep in mind as we break apart D1 is that we're going to use the standard normal distribution in order to calculate the final probabilities. Instead of setting the mean at zero, we're going to set the strike price as the mean. And we're going to calculate how good in the money or how far out of the money in terms of standard deviations everything is. First thing first, what I'd like to do is break D1 into two parts. This first part of the formula is going to tell us how good or how far away from the mean or the strike price the current stock price is. So we take the current stock price divided by the strike price and we calculate the price relative to back out the continuously compounded return. Once we've converted our price relative in continuously compounded terms, what we want to do next is divide it by the standard deviation times the square root of time. The reason why we times it by the square root of time is because the standard deviation is quoted or volatility is quoted in annual terms. And so we want to adjust it for time until expiration. Square root of time because standard deviation is the square root of variance. Now that we've divided the price relative, we've gone ahead and converted it into standard deviations. How far away is the stock price in terms of standard deviations from the strike? Or how far past the strike in terms of standard deviations is the current stock price? Let's look at the numerator of the second part of D1. 0.5 standard deviation squared plus R all times T. The reason why we add 0.5 variance squared is because only half the variance is going to work in our favor. The other half is not. We also add the risk-free interest rate because until expiration, theoretically, the stock should at least earn the risk-free interest rate. We then times that by t because we're only going to earn that variance in that risk-free interest rate until expiration. We then divide by standard deviation times root of t, square root of t, because we're again going to normalize it for the amount of standard deviations. Let's go ahead and look at D2. D2 is a much more simple formula than D1. It's basically D1 minus volatility. D1 minus standard deviation adjusted for time. This reflects the fact that not all volatility is going to work in our favor. Sometimes the volatility is going to go against us.
We finally have all the parts and we can now calculate the value of the Black-Scholes formula. We can scale the current stock price for D1 minus the present value of the strike price for D2. Something else you might have noticed, when a stock is very, very in the money, D1 is going to approach a very, very high number and the probability of D1 is going to approach 1. And even though D2 has 1 unit subtracted from it, it's still going to approach 1. So for a stock that's very high in the money, you're basically looking at stock price minus strike price, which is no surprise. We know that in the money options, deep in the money options, trade near intrinsic value. In this example, we've calculated the Black-Scholes formula backwards. We've used the implied volatility to calculate the call dollar price. But in the real world, what people use the Black-Scholes formula for is given a call dollar price, what is the implied volatility? In reality, computers mostly calculate the Black-Scholes formula because it's a highly iterative process, meaning that we just try to plug in an implied volatility and if it doesn't match the final output that, this, that the market is pricing right now, we try another implied volatility and try another and try another until finally the stock price or the stock option price in the theoretical value matches the stock option price in the market. And that's how we back out implied volatility of market-based dollar prices. I hope this lesson was helpful for you. And until next time, find edge, capture alpha, and slang size.